Hello, and welcome to this fast-paced presentation on COVID-19, Stopping the Spread. We are going to highlight actions to take and highlighting some key strategies for screening and testing today. We know that an essential component of the prevention of spread is to prevent the virus from entering your facility. Good screening in combination with testing are essential components for success. My name is Lisa Thompson and I'm the Chief Strategy Officer for Pathway Health. And also joining me today is Sue LaGrange. She's the Director of Education and she leads the COVID Task Force for Pathway Health Service and is also a board certified infection preventionist. In order to put in place a good system, putting together a team of professionals will help you to review all expected state and federal guidance, then to develop policies and procedures, identify necessary supplies that are gonna be needed, and then contact vendors to access those supplies, provide initial and ongoing education to the employees, and then monitor for compliance. Education will need to be done initially and ongoing and needs to include the entire process from equipment use, when to test, how to collect specimens, PPE, personal protective equipment necessary, hand hygiene, how to read results, reporting, cleaning and disinfection, and what they're supposed to do with a positive result. So it's going to be important to assign authority for the whole process. Another aspect in stopping the spread in our organizations is the part of preventing the spread is to prevent the virus from entering the building at all. And that's screening. So that means screening of employees, visitors, vendors, contract staff, and those alike. It's very crucial to success. Screening must be active screening, meaning staff cannot self-screen. Also, when we look at this and when we're doing the screening process, we know we look at signs and symptoms, but one thing is key to remember is that fever is defined as 100 degrees or higher for staff or for residents. And a temperature of 100 degrees Fahrenheit or more than two temperatures above 99 degrees Fahrenheit is also considered a fever. So again, making sure that we have up-to-date screening tools and we're actively screening our residents, our staff, and visitors or vendors, and making sure that we're following the key components and we're not self-screening. There are several different types of testing. There's diagnostic testings, for SARS-CoV-2, which is coronavirus or COVID-19. And that's intended to identify current infection in individuals and is performed when a resident or person or staff member has signs or symptoms that's consistent with COVID-19. Or if someone is asymptomatic, but had recent exposure or suspected exposure to COVID-19. Next is screening testing. And this for COVID is intended to identify infected persons who are asymptomatic without known or suspected exposure to COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2. Screening testing is performed in order to identify persons who may be contagious so that measures can be taken to prevent further transmission. The CDC also talks about surveillance testing, which is strictly used for public health surveillance. So we won't be talking about that today. And we also know part of the testing protocol is looking at the rapid antigen testing. And we know it can be used at point of care. And we also know how quickly we can get the results within about 15 minutes. And it can be used for screening in high risk settings, such as in our communal settings and long-term care. And all allows for prompt implementation of our infection prevention and control measures in order to prevent spread within our organizations. So we know facilities, we've received our rapid antigen devices for point of care rapid antigen testing. And generally we know that they're less sensitive than the viral testing that really detects the nucleic acid using. So that's part of that, the RT-PCR testing. And we also know it performs best when individuals tested in the early stages of COVID-19 infection. So that means the viral load is generally at its highest. For employee testing 
or staff testing, it is completed for staff that have signs or symptoms of COVID-19 based upon screening or if an employee indicates that they now have symptoms. Asymptomatic staff also with known or suspected exposure, whether it is inside or outside the facility. Also, staff testing is completed for asymptomatic staff according to routine testing by the community COVID-19 positivity rate. Staff testing is also completed for staff who have been diagnosed with COVID-19 to determine if no longer infectious only in some cases, because the CDC does indicate that a test-based strategy is no longer recommended, such as someone who is severely immunocompromised, because in the majority of cases, it results in excluding from work the healthcare personnel who continue to shed detectable SARS-CoV-2 RNA, but they are no longer infectious. And we know there are three triggers for testing. When there's a symptomatic, asymptomatic individual identified, and any new cases in the facility, even one case is considered an outbreak for COVID-19 and routine testing in accordance with CMS guidance. So again, you can see the testing, the triggers that they're on the far left-hand side. So for outbreak testing, all staff and residents should be tested and all staff and residents that tested negative should be retested every three to seven days until, until the testing identifies no new cases of COVID-19 infection among staff or residents for a period of at least 14 days since the most recent positive result. For more information, please review, you know, the section that is entitled in the document that you can see here and the link that there's a section in the QSO memo that goes into more specific details. It is also documented that when there are significant cases of COVID-19 in the county or in the community, the chances of COVID-19 coming into your building, sometimes by asymptomatic staff, who unknowingly bring it in is higher. This is why routine testing is determined by the community COVID-19 activity level. And as you can see, there is a graph on the slide that indicates the minimum testing frequency based on the county positivity rate in the past week. And you can see here on the, on the slide here, there's the, the link to a great website for all of us to go back to and refer to. Because CDC indicates that all testing for SARS-CoV-2, including the rapid antigen testing, is directly impacted by the integrity of the specimen, which really depends on specimen collection and handling. So this website is available to us and it's very essential that whoever is collecting the specimens for testing is donning the first, the most appropriate appropriate PPE, and that needs to include first, perform hand hygiene, then don your gloves, gown, N95 respirator, and face shield or goggles. Next is follow-up with the test results. Immediate placement decision for a resident, for example, placing a resident on a COVID-19 positive unit on precautions if symptoms and a confirmed positive test. We will discuss that more on the next slide. For employees, we would send them home immediately and work with employee health for follow-up. And then notifications, physician, resident representative, and other reporting, public health, CLIA, NHSN, all residents and representatives per facility leadership. Retesting in accordance with the tables discussed earlier and also the facility plan for new cases, room moves, and emergency uh, staffing. I do want to indicate that follow-up with test results, when we're looking at that immediate placement decision for a resident, it is important that before we put them on a COVID-19 unit, that we do have a verification of that confirmed test result. And another strategy for stopping the spread in your organization is resident placement, as Sue talked about, and making sure we have that good, solid testing strategy in place. That resident placement is having that need of a dedicated space or location for your COVID-19 care unit and a staffing plan for dedicated staff or consistent assignment with their own restroom, break room, and other work area that is separate from those caring for the other residents in your organization. 
dedicated equipment is essential for this unit as well. It should be cleaned and disinfected if using in between residents on the COVID-19 care unit. And for any exposed residents, new residents, or suspected residents until testing is completed, residents should be quarantined. Private room with their own bathroom, ideally on a quarantine unit or a space with no cohorting. Additional measures, as Lisa indicated, consistent assignment and dedicated staff is essential, but it's also important that if you have housekeeping, that they are also dedicated to that unit with the same break room and employee restroom as well. PPE use in accordance with the best practice approach with CDC and your facility policy and procedure and following CDC's optimization guidance. Next hand hygiene, hand hygiene, hand hygiene. It's important that staff are following good hand hygiene. And then cleaning and disinfection in accordance with best practices using EPA registered list and against SARS-CoV-2, which is COVID-19. And of course, making sure facility staff are following all of your policies and procedures with COVID-19. So in summary, with our short little presentation here on stopping the spread, Early identification of an employee or resident is crucial in the prevention of the spread of COVID-19 in long-term care facilities. Active screening for all and testing in accordance with the most recent guidance will provide information to put prompt mitigation steps in place in order to stop the spread. Sue and I wanna thank you today for participating in this presentation on some key strategies on stopping the spread within your organization.